And then I need to stop the transmission. Next is to display the slides. <laughs> And then before I go ahead, I need to find out if Jessica can hear me. So Jessica, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so the mics of attendees is disabled. Deductive reasoning. Welcome to the second half of the semester. The first half was a preparation for the second. In that preparation, we studied concepts in language and meaning. We studied statements that are not logical. We learned to identify passages that are argumentative or not. Now, it is time to study arguments. Now to the different forms of reasoning. <clears throat> Arguments are also called reasoning or syllogisms. The three terms are used interchangeably. And there are two major categories of reasoning. We have deductive and we have inductive. Deductive and inductive reasoning. We also have causal reasoning but it's a form of inductive reasoning. So the two major categories are deductive and inductive. Now to deductive reasoning. <coughs> deductive reasoning is also called deductive argument or deductive syllogism. Now, this is reasoning in which the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is a logical relationship. The relationship between the premises and the conclusion is a logical relationship. As a result of this, it's reasoning that permits only one conclusion. It's reasoning that permits only one conclusion. Just as 2 plus 2 permits only one conclusion, which is 4, Deductive reasoning permits only one conclusion. For example, all men are mortal. Kofi is a man, therefore Kofi is mortal. Now, only this conclusion is possible. You cannot change or modify a conclusion. Example, you can't say Kofi is immortal. Or say a fire cabinet is mortal. So none of these conclusions is possible. It's just one conclusion, and that Kofi is mortal. Since you say that all men are mortal, and since you say that Kofi is a man, then the conclusion is that Kofi is mortal. So that's a deductive argument. Before we go into deductive reasoning, let's look at two parts of a sentence, just like uh, which are analogous to the subject and the predicate. Now, when we are discussing arguments, we don't refer to the two parts of the sentence as subject and predicate. We refer to them as reference class and attribute class. So the reference class is analogous to the subject. The attribute class is analogous to the predicate. For example, all men are mortal. All men is a reference class. Our mortal is the attribute class. So the reference class is that to which the sentence refers. The reference class is that to which the, uh, the sentence refers. Whilst the attribute class is that part of the sentence that is attributing something to or saying something about the reference class. Now, there are two kinds of reference classes. You have the finite and infinite reference classes. The 
finite and infinite reference classes. The infinite reference class refers to all members or no members of a class, either 100% or 0%. Example, all men, no man, any man. So you cannot count the items in, the, in these classes. All men are uncountable. So also is no man, any man. These are classes referring to uncountable items. On the other hand, the finite reference class refers to countable and particular members of a class, anything between 0% and 100%. Example, some men, 80% of men, five men, all the men, few men, almost all the men. Now, all the men is countable, but all men are not countable, all the men are countable. Now, all men refers to all men, both born and unborn. But all the men refers to all the men in this particular place. All the men in this class, all the men in this town, all the men in this country, all the men in this world. They are all countable. Then there's a distinction between universal and particular statements. Now, statements containing infinite reference class are called universal statements, whilst those containing finite reference classes are called particular statements. The example of universal statements, all men are mortal. All men are mortal. Example of particular statements, some men drink alcohol. Some men drink alcohol. So the universal statements are the ones containing the infinite reference class. The particular statements are the ones containing the finite reference class. Now a little exercise. Which statements are universal and which are particular? Now, either universal or particular statement. This table is trillect. This table is trillect. Is it a universal or particular statement? Now we have 20 persons. Uh, so anyone who is going to answer should raise his hand and I'll now allow your microphones. So anyone who wants to answer should raise his, his or her hand and indicate whether a particular statement is universal or particular. This table is three-legged. Is it universal or particular? <coughs> Godwin, Godwin, you can unmute your microphone. It's three leg. It's particular. It's first to a particular kind of table that it has three leg. Okay. Particular statement. <clears throat> Tables can be sat on. Is it particular or universal? Tables can be sat on. Angelina. You can unmute your microphone. Sir, please, it's universal. Universal, good. James and Mary pass the examination. James and Mary pass the examination. Is it particular or universal? Godwin, you can answer that if you want. It is um, particular. Particular statement. Particular. All visitors should be treated with respect. All visitors should be treated with respect. Angelina, you can answer that. Say universal. Universal, okay, fine. So let's go on. Now there's the issue of validity. When a deductive argument is correct, we say it is valid. It is valid. And because of the 100% accuracy of deductive arguments, we say that a correct deductive argument is a valid argument. 
apart from a correct deductive argument, no other argument is valid. So even inductive arguments are not valid. Now, an argument is valid if the premises make the conclusion necessary and the conclusion follows with certainty. All valid arguments are deductive arguments. So inductive arguments are strictly not valid. A deductive argument is a purely mathematical argument. The relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. So you can refer back to the example that of deductive arguments that we saw. Now let's compare that to an inductive argument. So now this is an example of an inductive argument. 95% of men are honest. Peter is a, a man. Therefore, Peter is honest. Now, so this is an inductive argument. You will see that more than one conclusion is possible. Peter could be among the 95% of men that are honest. Or Peter could be among the 5% that are dishonest. So more than one conclusion is possible. Possible conclusion one, Peter is honest. Possible conclusion two, Peter is not honest. So because there is more than one legitimate conclusion, we say it's an inductive argument. That is how we identify inductive arguments. If it is only one possible conclusion, then it's a, a deductive argument. Now let's look at the hidden condition if and then. If and then. Statements that contain if and then, we call them conditional statements. If I eat this food, I will grow tall. If this happens, then that happens. If I borrow that money, I'll buy a car. If that, if this, then that. If that, then this. We call them conditional statements. Now there are two ways of looking at arguments. You can look at them from the categorical or from the conditional angle. You can look at them in categorical or conditional ways. All arguments have hidden conditionals. All arguments have hidden conditionals. Now look at this categorical statement. All men are mortal. All men are mortal. That's a categorical statement. Now to change it to a conditional statement, you will say, if something is a man, then it is mortal. All men are mortal. If something is a man, then it's mortal. That's a conditional version. So now let's go back to our deductive argument example. Let's change a categorical statement of premise one to a conditional statement. Premise one, if something is a man, then it's mortal. Premise two, Peter is a man. Conclusion, therefore, Peter is mortal. So when you change the premise one from a categorical statement to a conditional statement, you see the argument more clearly. It helps you to analyze the argument faster and in a clearer way. Now, if something is a man, then it is mortal. Peter is a man, therefore Peter is mortal. So it helps you to see the flu as well as the force of necessity of the argument. Now let's replace words with symbols. Let's replace words with symbols. Now look at this categorical version. All men are mortal. All is a bees. To replace it with uh, the words with symbols, all is a bees. Peter is a man. X is an A. Now men are represented by A's. Mortal is represented by B's. So all is a bees. So Peter is a man who will be X is an A, and Peter is mortal with X is a B. So all A's are B's, X is an A, therefore X is a B. That's to replace the words with symbols. Now let's look at the conditional version. If something is a man, then it is mortal. Peter is a man, then therefore Peter is mortal. If A, then B. If A, then B. X is an A, therefore S is a B. Or you can say, if A, then B. A, then therefore B.
Now, it is very good to distinguish between what we call antecedents and consequence. Um, it is these two terms that you'll be using to do your deductive reasoning. Antecedents and consequence. Now, remember the reference class and the attribute class. The reference class is like a subject. The attribute class is like a predicate. Now, if we restate any categorical proposition as a conditional statement, if we restate any categorical proposition as a conditional one, the reference class becomes the antecedent and the attribute class becomes the consequent. Example, all A are B, or if A, then B. All A are B is categorical. If A, then B is conditional. The reference class, in this case A, is the antecedent. And the attribute class, in this case B, is the consequent. So the reference class is normally taken as the antecedent, and the attribute class is normally taken as the consequent. A is the antecedent, and B is the consequent. So any statement referring to A will be either affirming or denying the antecedent, and any statement referring to B will be either affirming or denying the consequent. Now, all A are B, or if A, then B. A is antecedent, B is consequent. If I say X is an A, X is an A, then I am making a statement that affirms the antecedent. If I say X is an A, it is a statement that affirms the antecedent. If I say X is a B, then it's a statement that affirms the consequent. If I say X is not an A, it is a statement that denies the antecedent. And if I say X is not a B, it's a statement that denies the consequent. So any statement referring to A will be either affirming or denying the antecedent. And any statement referring to B will be either affirming or denying the consequent. Example, X is an A, affirms the antecedent. X is not an A, denies the antecedent. X is a B, affirms the consequent. X is not a B, denies the consequent. Now, let's go to affirming the antecedent. All A's are B's. X is an A, therefore X is a B. Now, you can see that the second premise is affirming the antecedent. The second premise is affirming the antecedent. For that reason, we would say that the whole argument affirms the antecedent. The whole argument affirms the antecedent. That's what we say. Or we we'll say that it is an argument that affirms the antecedent in order to reach its conclusion. It is an argument that affirms the antecedent in order to reach its conclusion. That is what we say. Denying the antecedent, all A's are B's. X is not an A, therefore X is not a B. So because the second premise is denying the antecedent, we will say that it is an argument that denies the antecedent in order to reach its conclusion. Affirming the consequent, all A's are B's, X is a B, therefore X is an A. Now, the second premise is affirming the consequent. So because of that, we'll say that it is an argument that affirms the consequent in order to reach its conclusion. Denying the consequent. Now, all A's are B's. X is not a B. Therefore, S is not an A. Now, because the second premise is denying the consequent, we'll say that it is an argument that denies the consequent in order to reach its valid conclusion, or sorry, in order to reach its conclusion. So we can see that there are four ways an argument can go. Either an argument is affirming the antecedent, or the argument is denying the antecedent, or the argument is affirming the consequent, or the argument is denying the consequent. These are four ways an argument can go. 
Now, the rule for deductive reasoning says that only two of those ways, only two of the four ways will lead you to a correct conclusion. Only two of the four ways will lead you to a correct conclusion. The other two would lead you to a fallacy. Now, the rule for deductive reasoning says we only affirm the antecedent or deny the consequent in order to reach a valid conclusion. We only affirm the antecedent and deny the consequent in order to reach a valid conclusion. Any other operation would make the argument lose its validity. So that means that denying the antecedent or affirming the consequent would lead you to an invalid conclusion. The only correct way to reach a conclusion is to either affirm the antecedent or deny the consequent. Now let's look at an example. All A's are B's. X is an A, which affirms the antecedent. Therefore, X is a B. Now, according to the rule for deductive reasoning, this argument is valid because it affirms the antecedent. Now, the other one, the second one, all A's are B's. X is not an A, which denies the antecedent. Therefore, X is not a B. Now, the rule for deductive reasoning says that this Denying the antecedent will lead you to an invalid conclusion. Now let's put the whole thing in words. Convert to words. All Ghanaians are Africans. Peter is a Ghanaian, which affirms the antecedent. Therefore, Peter is an African. So we are told it's a valid argument. And why is it a valid argument? Let's look at it again. All Ghanaians are Africans, yes. Peter is a Ghanaian, okay. Therefore, Peter is an African. Of course, if all Ghanaians, if all Ghanaians are Africans and Peter is a Ghanaian, then Peter is an African because if all Ghanaians are African, then any Ghanaian will be an African automatically. That's why the argument is valid. Then the second example, all Ghanaians are Africans. Peter is not a Ghanaian, which denies the antecedent. Therefore, Peter is not an African. Now, we are told this is not a valid argument. And why? So let's look at it again. All Ghanaians are Africans, yes? Peter is not a Ghanaian, okay. Therefore, Peter is not an African. Now, is Peter not being a Ghanaian enough to show he is not an African? If you prove that Peter is not a Ghanaian, is it enough to have shown that he's not an African? The answer is no. If you prove that he's not a Ghanaian, you still need to prove that he is not from any other African country. You need to prove that he's not a Nigerian, he's not a Cameroonian, he's not a Togolese, he's not a South African, he's not a Kenyan, and he's not from any of the other African countries, before you can arrive at the conclusion that Peter is not an African. Now, that has not been done. So saying that Peter is not a Ghanaian is not a valid reason for saying that Peter is not an African. And that is why an argument that denies the antecedent would give you an invalid conclusion. An argument that denies the antecedent will give you an invalid conclusion. Now let's look at the technicality. The consequent is always a larger class of denotations or members compared to the antecedent. The consequent contains the denotations of both the antecedent and possibly more. So, the, 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 the antecedent and the consequent, both of them are classes of items. You can see them as classes of items. And those classes have size. The size of the consequent class is bigger than the size of the antecedent class. The consequent class has more items in it compared to the antecedent class. Why? Because when you say that the antecedent an antecedent is a consequent. You have not automatically said the consequent is an antecedent. When you say an antecedent is a consequent, you're only showing that the antecedent is part 
of the consequent. But the consequent is possibly more, contains possibly more than the antecedent. Okay. Now the consequent Africans contains more members than the antecedent Ghanaians. So when you deny something of membership in a smaller class, you have not denied it of membership in a larger class. But when you deny something of membership in a larger class, containing all the members of a smaller class, you have automatically denied it of membership in a smaller class. <clears throat> now, so if you say that everything in a smaller class is part of a larger class, then automatically, if you identify Peter to be in a smaller class, it means Peter is in a larger class because everything in a smaller class is in a larger class. Now, if you say that Peter is not in the smaller class, you have not automatically shown he's not in the larger class because there are other things in the larger class that are different from the ones in the smaller class since the larger class is larger than the smaller class. So denying Peter of membership in the smaller class does not automatically deny him of membership in a larger class. Okay, so let's look at the illustration. But before then, let's look at four kinds of deductive argument based on you know, the relationship between the antecedent and the consequent and based on the four possible ways an argument can go. Now, modus ponens is an argument that affirms the antecedent. All A's are B's, X is an A, therefore X is a B. Now, we say that it is a modus ponens. It's an argument that affirms the antecedent. So, any argument that affirms the antecedent is a modus ponens. A modus ponens is an argument that affirms the antecedent. All A's are B's, X is an A, X, therefore X is a B. And it is a valid, the rule for deductive reasoning tells us it's a valid argument. Then you have the fallacy of denying the antecedent. All A's are B's, S is not an A, S not a B. We are told this is not a valid argument. So we call it the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Now look at the sizes of the antecedent and the consequent. Now the consequent is a larger box compared to the antecedent. Now you notice that the antecedent box is completely in the consequent box. So everything in the antecedent is automatically also in the consequent. That is why we said all Ghanaians are Africans. Peter is a Ghanaian, therefore automatically Peter is an African. But if you say all Ghanaians are Africans, yes, Peter is not a Ghanaian. It doesn't show that he's not an African. He could be in any other part of Africa apart from Ghana. So look at the box African and the box Ghanaians. If you show that Peter is a Ghanaian, automatically you've shown that he's an African. Because everything in Ghana is in Africa. But if you show that Peter is not a Ghanaian, you have not automatically shown he's not an African. Because... Showing that he's not a Ghanaian is not enough to show he's not an African. He, he, he may not be a Ghanaian, but he could come from any other part of Africa. So it's not enough to show that he's not a Ghanaian in order to show that he's not an African. That is why we say that denying the antecedent will not lead you to a valid argument. But affirming the antecedent will lead you to a valid argument. Now let's look at modus tollens. All A are B. X is not a B, therefore X is not an A. Now this is an argument that denies the consequent. An argument that denies the consequent. And we are told by the rule of deductive reasoning that denying the consequent will lead you to a valid conclusion. In words, all Ghanaians are Africans. Michael is not an African, therefore Michael is not a Ghanaian. Now, if you say that all Ghanaians are Africans, but you say Michael is not an African, it's enough to show he's not a Ghanaian. If Michael is not an African, then he cannot come from anywhere inside Africa, including Ghana. So showing that Michael is not an African is already enough to show he's not from Ghana. You can, we can go back to the box. Now, the African box 
is bigger than the Ghanaian box. And it completely contains the Ghanaian box. If you are able to show that someone is not from Africa, then automatically you have shown he's not from Ghana. Because everything in the Ghana box is in the African box. That is why we say that denying the consequent will lead you to a valid conclusion about the antecedent. So you say all A are B, S is not a B, therefore S is not an A. Yes, all Ghanaians are Africans, my case is not an African, therefore my case is Ghanaian. That's a valid argument. Michael is not an African is enough to show that Michael is not a Ghanaian. Denying the consequent is enough to, to prove the conclusion. Let's look at the department and the university. All those studying in the Department of Physics are enrolled at the University of Ghana. Kevin is not enrolled at the University of Ghana, so Kevin is not studying in the Department of Physics. So let's assume that there is a debate about whether Kevin is in the Department of Physics or not. And some people are saying Kevin is in the Department of Physics. Some are saying he's not in the Department of Physics. And then we decide to go to the university to find out whether it is true. And we go to the registry. And those in the registry enter Kevin's name on the university student database. And Kevin's name does not even show on the student database of the university. And then those in the registry or the registrar tells us that Kevin is not enrolled at the University of Ghana. Kevin is not enrolled at the University of Ghana. Then what does what happens to the debate? Automatically it means that he's not in the Department of Physics. So denying Kevin of membership in the university is enough to deny him of membership in the department. That's why denying the consequent will lead you to a valid conclusion. But affirming the consequent will lead you to an invalid conclusion. Showing that Kevin is in the University of Ghana is not enough to show you that he's in the Department of Physics. If you show that Kevin is in the, department, in the University of Ghana, it might be that He's in the University of Ghana, but he's in another department. So when you show that Kevin is in the University of Ghana, it's not enough for the conclusion that he's in the Department of Physics. But if you deny that Kevin is in the University of Ghana, it is enough for the conclusion that he's not in the Department of Physics. So these are the sizes of the University of Ghana and the Department of Physics. You can see that the Department of Physics is in the University of Ghana. All you need to do to show that Kevin is not in the Department of Physics is to simply show that he's not in the University of Ghana. That's all. And that's why we say that denying the consequent will lead you to a valid conclusion. The fallacy of affirming the consequent. So all A are B, X is an A, therefore S is a B. We said this is not a valid argument. All Ghanaians are Africans. George is an African, therefore George is a Ghanaian. George is an African, therefore George is a Ghanaian. Showing that George is an African is not enough to conclude that he's a Ghanaian. George is an African, yes, but it's not enough. He, he, he could be from any other African country. So it is not enough to show that he's a Ghanaian by simply showing that he's an African. That's why we say that conf uh, affirming the consequent, affirming the consequent cannot lead you to a valid conclusion. Affirming the consequent is an invalid argument. The consequent Africans contains a logically larger category of the notations than the antecedent Ghanaians. So the fact that George is an African does not necessarily mean that he's a Ghanaian. He may be a South African or a Cameroonian. If we affirm the consequent, we're not sure we can affirm the antecedent. In short, if we affirm the consequent, it will land us in the same kind of uncertainty that we saw in the fallacy of denying the, the antecedent. So denying the antecedent and affirming the consequent, uh, both of them are invalid arguments. 
Now let's look at another form of the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Now we have seen that affirming the consequent is invalid. Now there's another form of affirming the consequent, which we may not know, you know, which we may, uh, you know, mistake for denying the consequent. Now let's look at this argument. All A are not B. All A are not B. X is not a B, therefore X is an A. All A are not B. X is not a B, therefore X is an A. Now the second premise looks like a denial. But we cannot call it a denier because the first premise is also a denier. So when the first premise is a denier, the second one is also a denier. Two negatives will give you a positive. So this is an example of affirming the consequent, not denying the consequent. So when you see negatives in the two premises, then it means it's, it is an affirmation. Two negatives will give you a positive. So remember that. Let's put it in words. All human beings are not good. X is not a good. Therefore, X is a human being. Now, yes, we accept that all human beings are not good. Yes. Now, if you show that X is not a good, have you automatically shown that X is a human being? The answer is no. If you show that X is not a good, X could be any other creature apart from a human being. X could be a giraffe or a tiger or something. So you can see that it, can, it is not a, it's not a valid argument. When there are deniers in both premises, it means that it's an affirmation argument. It's not a denial argument. It's an affirmation. The two denials amount to an affirmation. And if the affirmation is affirming the consequent, then it cannot work. Again, not being a good is a larger, is a logically larger category than all human beings. So the fact that X is not a good does not necessarily make X a human being. X could as well be a cat, giraffe, or tiger. So that concludes our discussion of the difference between modus ponens and modus tollens. And we have seen their fallacies. So modus ponens affirming the consequent We've seen the fallacy of denying the consequent. Then modus tollens is denying the, uh, sorry, um, modus ponens is affirming the antecedent, and we've seen the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Then modus ponens, uh, modus tollens is denying the consequent, and we've seen the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Now let's go to hypothetical syllogism. Now modus ponens and modus tollens are two valid forms of deductive reasoning. They are the two, there are two valid forms of deductive reasoning. There are four of them, so we're going to look at the other two. The other two are hypothetical syllogism and disjunctive syllogism. Now let's look at hypothetical syllogism. <coughs> A hypothetical syllogism is an argument where the consequent of an initial or first premise becomes the antecedent of the second or subsequent premise. And the subsequent premises feature the consequence of their predecessors as their antecedents. Now, the consequent of an initial premise becomes the antecedent of a second or subsequent premise. Now, so if you say all A are B, all A are B, and B is a consequent, then the next premise will start with the B as an antecedent. So all A are B, all B are C then C will start the next premise, all C are D, and so on. So it will be all A are B, all B are C, all C are D. Uh -huh. That's where the consequent of an initial or first premise becomes the antecedent of a second or subsequent premise. And then subsequent premises feature the consequence of their predecessors as their antecedents. 
Then the conclusion will bring together or pair the very first antecedent with the very last consequent. So if the, the argument went, if the premises went from A to Z, all A or B, or B or C, or C or D, or E or F, down to Z, then the conclusion will be, will bring together A, which is the first antecedent, and Z, which is the last consequent. And then the conclusion will be, therefore, all A are Z. The conclusion brings together the very first antecedent and the very last consequent. Example, all A are B, all B are C. Therefore, all A are C. Now, so you can see all A are B. B, which is the consequent, became the antecedent of the next premise. All B are C. And then the conclusion brings together the first antecedent and the last consequent, so which is A and C. That's the character of a hypothetical syllogism. Now you can add more premises up to Z. All A are B, all B are C, all C are D, all D are E, and F down to Z, and then the conclusion will be, therefore, all A are Z. Now let's put it in words. All Ghanaians are Africans. All Africans are human beings. Therefore, all Ghanaians are human beings. So that's a hypothetical syllogism. We notice that the consequent of the first premise, which is B, becomes the antecedent of the second premise. And the antecedent of the second premise, which is the consequent of the first premise, leads us to a new party, which is C, as the consequent. Any additional subsequent premise will typically feature the consequent of its predecessor as its antecedent, so that it is linked conditionally to a fresh party. So that's how hypothetical syllogism works. Now, hypothetical syllogism has two kinds of fallacies. There are two fallacies of hypothetical syllogism. Let's look at the first fallacy. All A are B, all B are C, therefore all C are A. So instead of saying all A, instead of saying therefore all A are C, you say therefore all C are A, you interchange the terms so that the first comes last and the last comes first. This is a fallacy. And let's see why it's a fallacy by putting it in words. All Ghanaians are Africans. All Africans are human beings. Therefore, all human beings are Ghanaians. So you can see why it's a fallacy. Now let's look at the second hypothetical fallacy. All A are C, all B are C. Now, instead of saying all A are B, all B are C, you say all A are C, and then all B are C. Therefore, all A are B. So why is it a fallacy? Let's look at it. All Ghanaians are Africans. All Kenyans are Africans. Therefore, all Ghanaians are Kenyans. So you can see it doesn't work. Now let's go back to the symbols. The fact that all A are C, the fact that all A's are C, and the fact that all B are C does not necessarily tell you the relationship between A and B. It doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the relationship between A and B. If A belongs to a house called C and B also belongs to a house called C, it doesn't automatically tell you that A and B are the same or for that matter, even tell you any other thing about A and B. Okay. Now, sometimes the conclusion of such an argument could be true by accident. Whenever it is true, you have to say that it is true by accident. Now, for example, all Ghanaians are human beings, all Africans are human beings, therefore all Ghanaians are Africans. Now, this conclusion is true, but it is true by accident. And it is not true because of the structure of the argument. It is just true because of what you know outside the argument. It is not the argument that helps you to know the conclusion is true. It is what you already know before the argument. 
That's why we say that it's an invalid argument, even when it gives you a true conclusion by accident. Now let's look at the last form of valid deductive reasoning. Disjunctive syllogism. This is a syllogism where the main premise is a disjunctive, an either or. A disjunctive is an either or. When the main premise is a disjunctive, an either or statement. When we affirm something of any of the disjunctive items, then we have automatically denied it the other disjunctive part. We have automatically denied it the other disjunctive part. Example. Either A is true or B is true. A is true, so B is false. Or either A is true or B is true. B is true, so A is false. Now let's put it in words. Either I became a reverend father or I got married. I got married, so I did not become a reverend father. Or either I became a reverend father or I got married. I became a reverend father, so I did not get married. Now, a little exercise. Determine what kind of argument this is. Anytime he goes to town, he passes by my mother's house. Today, he passed by my mother's house, so he went to town. Anytime he goes to town, he passes by my mother's house. Today he passed by my mother's house, so he went to town. Anytime he goes to town is the antecedent. He passes by my mother's house is a consequent. So what kind of argument is this? Is this an argument that affirms the antecedent or denies the antecedent or it affirms a consequent or it denies a consequent. Oh, so if you want to if you want to attend the question, you can raise your hand. Let me uh, okay, sorry. I think your microphones are already enabled. So if you want to answer, you can raise your hand on mute your microphone so that others can hear you. Is it an argument that affirms the antecedent or denies the antecedent, or it affirms or denies the consequent? Or is it a hypothetical syllogism or a disjunctive syllogism? What, which exactly is it? Now, I've mentioned that any time he goes to town, is the antecedent, he passes by my mother's house, is the consequent. Okay, so let me help to sort it out. Any time he goes to town, is the antecedent, he passes by my mother's house is a consequent. So what is the second premise doing? Today he passed by my mother's house. So the second premise is affirming the consequent. Second premise is affirming the consequent. So that means the argument is invalid because affirming the consequent would be an invalid argument. So we would say that this argument is the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Now let's answer correctly. <clears throat> we deduce correctly when we deny the antecedent. Do we deduce correctly when we deny the antecedent? Denying the antecedent would be invalid. So 
we deduce correctly when we deny the antecedent is false. Number two, we deduce correctly when we affirm the antecedent is true. Number three, we deduce correctly when we deny the consequent is true. And number four, we deduce correctly when we affirm the consequent is false. Now let's look at validity versus soundness. Now the four types of deductive syllogism are four ways of making deductively valid arguments. So modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, they are four valid arguments, four types of valid deductive arguments. Or you just say four types of valid arguments. A valid argument is an argument whose premises are logically consistent with this conclusion. The premises of a valid argument necessarily imply its conclusion in the manner that it is impossible to deny the inference without running into self-contradiction. So there's nothing you can do about a valid argument. It's just a valid argument and it cannot be invalidated. Now, an invalid argument is an argument whose premises do not logically imply the conclusion. The relation between the premises and the conclusion is not that of logical necessity. You can proceed to deny the conclusion of an invalid argument without contradicting yourself. So when we start to discuss inductive reasoning, you will find out that the relation between the premises and the conclusion is not logical. That's for inductive reasoning. The relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not logical. You can even deny the conclusion and affirm the premises without contradiction. But that's for our next class. Now, the formal fallacies, now the invalid arguments, we call them, or rather the fallacies we saw here are called formal fallacies. So the fallacy of, uh, of denying the antecedent and the fallacy of affirming the consequent and then the two hypothetical fallacies, they are called, they are all called formal fallacies. They are for the fallacies that occur in deductive reasoning. They are fallacies that occur in deductive reasoning. Now, we've seen what makes an argument valid. An argument is valid if it is either a modus ponens a modus tollens, a hypothetical syllogism, or a disjunctive syllogism. So those conditions are enough for validity. But an argument could be valid but not sound. An argument could be valid but not sound. Let's look at this. All human beings are immortal. Peter is a human being, therefore Peter is immortal. All human beings are immortal. Peter is a human being. Therefore, Peter is immortal. This argument is valid because it is a correct modus ponens. It's correct because it affirms the antecedent. But the argument is not sound because one of the premises is not true. So premise one is not true. All human beings are immortal is not true. <clears throat> so the, you will say the argument is valid because it is a correct modus ponens. Or rather, it is a modus ponens, so it, the argument is valid. But the argument is not sound because the argument is not true. So an argument could be valid, but it is not true. For a, an argument to be sound, it needs to be both valid and true. Other examples, all men are mammals. All mammals must get killed. Therefore, all men must get killed. Now, this is a valid hypothetical syllogism. This is just like saying all A are B, all B are C, therefore all A are C. So this is a hypothetical syllogism. It's a valid argument. But is it a sound argument? It's not a sound argument because it is not true. Prem premise two is not true. All members must get killed is not true. So because of that, the entire argument is not sound. 
even though it is valid. <clears throat> now, you can have an invalid argument with a true conclusion, an argument that is invalid, but the conclusion is true. In that case, you say the conclusion is true by accident, like we've already seen before. Now, democracy is better than other forms of political organization because citizens in a democracy are holier than citizens in another form of political organization. Now, so this statement contains a conclusion and a supporting premise. Now, what is the conclusion? Democracy is better than other forms of political organization. That's a conclusion. It comes before the premise. The premise is because citizens in a democracy are holier than citizens in another form of political organization. So do we accept the conclusion, democracy is better than other forms of political organization? Yes, we accept it. Do we accept the premise, because citizens in a democracy are holier than citizens in another form of political organization? No, we don't accept the premise. So we accept the conclusion, but we don't accept the premise. That means it's an invalid argument with a true conclusion. It's an invalid argument with a true conclusion. Now, true conclusion alone does not make an invalid argument correct. True conclusion alone does not make an invalid argument correct. Now, we can have valid and sound. To be sound, all the premises in a valid argument must be true. To be sound, all the premises in a valid argument must be true. All men are mortal. Peter is a man, therefore Peter is mortal. So this argument is valid because it's a modus ponens, and it is also sound because all the statements in the argument are correct, are true. So it's soundness needs both validity and truth. So we have three possible forms. We have valid and sound, valid and unsound, and we have invalid and unsound. So we've already seen valid and sound and valid and unsound. Now valid and sound, another example of valid and sound. All snakes are reptiles, that's true. Cobra is a snake, that's true. Therefore, cobra is a reptile, that's true. So all the statements are true. And it is a modus ponens. So it is valid because it affirms the antecedent. And it is true because all the premises are true. Valid but unsound. Valid but unsound. All snakes are reptiles. That's true. Mosquitoes are snakes. That's false. Therefore, mosquitoes are reptiles. That's false. So, is it valid? Yes, it's valid. It's valid. Mosquitoes are snakes. Affirms the antecedent. Mosquitoes are snakes. Affirms the antecedent. So, it is valid because it affirms is an argument that affirms the antecedent in order to reach its conclusion. But it's unsound because one of the premises is not true. One of the premises is not true, so it is unsound. You can have both invalid and unsound, which is a double jeopardy. All snakes are reptiles, that's true. Mosquitoes are reptiles, that's false. Therefore, mosquitoes are snakes, that's false. It's invalid. Now, mosquitoes are reptiles, affirms the consequent. Mosquitoes are reptiles. It affirms the consequent. Apart from the fact that it is false, it also affirms the consequent. Now, the argument is invalid because the argument affirms the consequent. And then it is also unsound because one of the premises is not true. Now, is an invalid but sound argument possible? No. An invalid argument is automatically unsound. It cannot be sound. Once an argument fails the correct rule for deductive reasoning, then it's also unsound. Even if all the premises are true, even if all the statements are true, it's, it's unsound. An invalid argument is unsound even if the premises and the conclusion are all true. All Ghanaians are Africans, that's true. Kofi is an African, that's true. Therefore, Kofi is a Ghanaian, that's true. 
So all of this, we can take them as true. But the argument aff uh, affirms the consequence. It affirms the consequence. So it is invalid. So the argument is not valid. And we cannot take it as a sound argument. This, this cannot be a sound argument because it is an invalid argument. If you want to know whether Kofi is a Ghanaian, which is the conclusion, it cannot be from knowing that he's an African. Kofi is an African, therefore Kofi is a Ghanaian. That's not, that's not how you show that Kofi is a Ghanaian. You cannot show that Kofi is a Ghanaian just by saying he's an African. So it, the argument is invalid, and for that reason, it's unsound. We regard it as unsound, even if all the statements and arguments are true. It's unsound. Technicality. Validity is needed for soundness. Soundness needs validity. But soundness is not needed for validity. Now, validity is needed for soundness, but soundness is not needed for validity. So validity can do without soundness, but soundness cannot do without validity. Some arguments are valid, but not true. So validity can really stand alone. But soundness needs both validity and truth. Okay, a little exercise. Identify the missing premise in each of the following deductive arguments. Identify the missing premise in each of the following deductive arguments. All military men play football. Bob play football. All military men play football. All military men play football. Bob plays football. There's a third premise which is missing. What premise is it? All military men play football. Bob plays football. What is the missing premise? The missing premise would be... Yes, Amma, can you answer that? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Bob, Bob is a military man. Bob is a military man. So all military men play football. Bob is a military man, therefore Bob plays football. So that's correct. All Americans are human beings. All Americans are mammals. What is the missing premise? Yes, so Nidal, Nidal, you can go ahead. So all human beings are mammals. All human beings are mammals. So let's arrange them. All human beings are mammals. All, Amer all Americans are human beings. So that affirms the antecedent. All human beings are mammals. All Americans are human beings, affirming the antecedent. Therefore, all Americans are mammals. So that's correct. Now answer correctly, which fallacy is committed by the following? All A's are C's, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are B's. All A's are C's, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are B's. So that's the second hypothetical fallacy. All Ghanaians are Africans, all Kenyans are Africans, therefore all Ghanaians are Kenyans. So that makes it a fallacy. Okay, describe the following arguments. Describe the following argument. All Europeans are not my friends. Ben is not a European, Ben is my friend. Well, it's a single argument, but it's presented, I've presented it in two versions. So instead of all Europeans are not my friend, you can say no European is my friend. 
No European is my friend. Ben is not a European, therefore Ben is my friend. No European is my friend. Ben is not a European, therefore Ben is my friend. What kind of argument is it? Modus ponens, modus tollens, fallacy of denying the antecedent, fallacy of uh, affirming the consequent. Yeah, so I have said before that when the first premise is a negation or a denial, and the second premise is also a denial or a negation, two negations will be an affirmation, or two denials will be a, uh, a point. Two negatives will be a positive. Two denials or negations will be an affirmation. So that means that it's an argument that affirms it is not an argument that denies. It's an argument that affirms because both premises are deniers. So it's an argument that affirms because two negatives is a positive. The question is, it is affirming what? Is it affirming the antecedent or the consequent? It's affirming the antecedent because European is antecedent. So this is an argument that affirms the antecedent. And affir affirming the antecedent is modus Ponens. So this argument is a modus ponens. So that's the end of the class. Next week, we shall be discussing inductive reasoning. Now, I will take any questions that you have, respond to them quickly before I stop recording and then I begin to upload the recording. So are there any questions so that I can quickly attend to them before I stop the recording? Okay, so I'm going ahead to stop the recording.